Uh, yes, welcome everyone to the third webinar in our series uh, for the Bioream uh, webinar series. Uh, it's uh, a great pleasure to welcome you all here and to welcome our uh, speaker for this third webinar, who is um, Alex Diaz. So Alex is a um, associate professor at UCL and has recently started work on the uh, Chimera project, with my, which many of you will have heard of, which is quite a large um, uh, essentially, uh, large scale, long. Well, it's not just it's not just long run, but it's a large scale modeling project. And Alejandro, in particular, is working on the um, working on the statistical side of this. So his his uh, expertise are in statistical modeling, Bayesian inference, history matching, and and emulation methods. Uh, and today. Uh, well, actually, we, we met at a recent Bioream Sandpit event, so a good reason, another good <laughs> another good connection made by one of these Bioream events. So uh, bear in mind that uh, these events are pretty good for meeting new people and getting your ideas out there. Um, and today, uh, Alex is going to talk about uh, his work on the Chimera project in particular, which is working on calibrating a, a large scale respiratory computer model um, and Without further ado, I'll pass it over to Alex. Thank you very much, Carl, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Alex Diaz. I work at the Clinical Operational Research Unit, which is part of the Department of Mathematics at UCL. And we're going to discuss uh, the details of how we're calibrating this computer model. Um, Firstly, I'll talk about Chimera, which is uh, the project we are working on currently. Then I'll give you the details of the model calibration, and then I'll offer some conclusions. So uh, Chimera, which stands for Collaborative Healthcare Innovation Through Mathematics, Engineering and Artificial Intelligence, is a EPSRC a national hub for mathematical sciences in healthcare, and uh, it's one of four of them. We are funded by the EPSRC from November 2020 until October 2024. And we have different partners, uh, uh, two hospitals in particular, Great Ormond Street Hospital and UCLH. Uh, we also collaborate with the Alan Turing Institute. We have a web page uh, that I invite you to, to visit to see more details of what we do. So we have different aims um, amongst which are the following. We are using real patient data provided by these two hospitals and we'd like to develop new mathematical and computational methods that are calibrated using this data uh, with the aim of building and understanding patient uh, physiology during critical illness and recovery. So this um, data comes from um, intensive care units. Uh, so we would like to improve methods for patient treatment uh, with these methods and by doing so we'd like to build an internationally recognized hub uh, which is multidisciplinary and multi-sector that is focused on these questions. Uh, the hub works by uh, dividing our work in, in six work packages, three of which, we, which are highlighted here in green, are the technical work packages. The first one uh, which is the one I lead, is on statistical learning and computational statistics. The second one has to do with the development and uh, testing and improving biomechanical models. Uh, the third one has to do with parameter learning through uh, neural networks. We have other three uh, work packages that have to do with uh, dissemination, uh, data curation and engagement with, uh, with patients. So on to the model calibration. Um, so what is the, the background in, in critical care? Well, mechanical ventilation is the most important therapeutic intervention for patients with respiratory failure. And uh, in the UK, 100,000 intensive care unit admissions undergo mechanical ventilation per year with an average daily cost of 1,500 pounds. These are figures from uh, before the pandemic. Uh, so, you know, with the current cost of living, etc., I'm sure these have to be revised up. 
um, and the clinician workload is uh, directly linked to patient outcomes. It's estimated that 1.7 human errors per patient per day are committed, so that um, results in high mortality rates. So the rationale for modeling or using computer models um, to study patient physiology is that it's very difficult to conduct research on critically ill patients. Um, why? Because clinical trials can be massively expensive, they can be difficult to design and have high failure rates. And also no single animal model replicates the complex pathophysiology of respiratory diseases. There is demand for more personalized treatment strategies, um, and this leads to strong interest from funding agencies and, uh, and also industry. So what you see here um, on these pictures are the monitors, the type of monitors to which patients are connected, and these monitors are the ones that provide the data sets that we're working with. So we have um, well, basically time series coming from uh, patients that, uh, and, and these time series measure uh, biomarkers uh, such as uh, heart rate, respiratory rate, etc., etc. So, so we have very, very massive uh, data sets. So there is this pressing need to calibrate our models using this data and trying to enhance clinical decision making uh, using mathematics. Now, the model that we are calibrating in one of the work packages or by collaboration between work packages is a pulmonary simulator. And this uh, simulator has been developed uh, throughout the recent years uh, by uh, different research groups, uh, most notably a research group in Warwick University. So I'm providing here a couple of references, but this list of course is not uh, exhaustive. And uh, one of the people who worked on this model, who is uh, Sina, he was with uh, us in Chimera and, uh, and we were working with this model that he helped develop. Um, Sina is in the audience and maybe later he can give us a bit more detail. So this uh, pulmonary simulator models the transport of air from mouth to airway and alveoli, plus trachea and conducting airways, uh, this called series dead space, which is this part of the, of the model, which is um, summarized in this diagram. Uh, the model consists of multiple alveolar compartments and it simulates the gas exchange between alveoli and capillaries and the gas exchange between blood and peripheral tissue uh, as well as uh, the heterogeneous distributions of pulmonary ventilation. So th this is, as I said, this is summarized in this diagram and this is uh, broadly the, the model that we are calibrating. <clears throat> so the total time, for example, 30 minutes of simulating a patient with mechanical ventilation has to be divided into small sampling intervals, for example, 20 milliseconds. <clears throat> and that would give us then uh, a number of iterations. And during each iteration, a large number of parameters are computed, amongst which are resistances, trachea, bronchi, alveoli, pressures, uh, CO2 and O2, stiffness, airflow, blood flow, gas exchanges, arterial blood gas content, etc. And uh, all this is, uh, is simulated with this uh, analogy with um, concepts from electrical engineering, uh, these uh, resistances and this uh, model of a circuit is what operates inside the model. Now, previously, to calibrate this model, and by calibration, I mean, uh, let's suppose that we have certain observation or certain target for one of these parameters, and we would like to infer what is the combination of inputs that would deliver that 
uh, the output of a model that would match this target. Previously, this was done during a, doing a genetic algorithm. So the genetic algorithm aims to minimize a function that in general can be expressed as this. So this is a fitness function that expresses the sum of, sum of square differences <clears throat> between the value of a parameter, in this case, theta i, so that that's one of the parameters of the model, and the target value. Okay, We would, <clears throat> we would want to minimize these uh, distances, this, the sum of the, of the square distances. And that's okay, one, one can do that, but there are a couple of disadvantages. The first one is that if we do this, there's a large computational cost involved. Um, before we started the project, this cost was of more than 12 hours. Um, but more importantly, because of course you can, or well, ideally you could get a bigger, more powerful machine, um, a bigger disadvantage that we see is that uh, this method produces only one combination of parameter values, which minimizes this uh, fitness function, uh, or this, um, what I mean by that is that when you run the genetic algorithm once, you would get a set of values for the parameters that are optimal, but that does not guarantee that if you run the genetic algorithm again, you would get uh, the same answer. Okay, because genetic algorithms um, tend to get stuck on local optima. Okay, so what we would want to avoid this, to solve this problem, is a method that produces a set of parameter values that are likely, in a measurable sense, um, to match the targets whilst also reducing the computational cost. So we would like to cope with these two disadvantages. <clears throat> and the way we are calibrating the model is using history matching. So the model uh, or the simulator can be thought of as an input-output mapping, right? So we have a function. This, this function is going to be an idealization of our model. <clears throat> and this uh, function takes values on an input space and then takes output, uh, for example, in the real numbers. Okay, if we have several outputs, then this would be uh, the Euclidean space in, in more dimensions. Now, history matching aims at identifying a subset of the input space, and we call that X star, for which the evaluation of a simulator gives an acceptable match to the observed data. Okay, we would like to identify this subset of the input space um, that would deliver good outputs in some measurable sense. <clears throat> now, this is an iterative process that starts by sampling from the input space, you sample from the whole input space, and then we apply some implausibility measure. And we'll get uh, to that uh, in a couple of minutes. Then by doing this iterative process, we start imposing some cutoffs so that we can obtain successive non implausible sets. Okay, so we start uh, by sampling from the whole input space and then we start finding subsets uh, that contain this optimal set and we try to get as close as possible to this optimal set. Uh, and this optimality is dictated by that implausibility function, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute. If the simulator is expensive, and typically if it's a realistic model, it will be, then an emulator or a surrogate model can be employed. Uh, so for those of you who have calibrated models, there's a subtle difference, uh, and this is why history matching sometimes is also called a pre-calibration stage, is that if you do, for example, Bayesian calibration or, or, or Bayesian model updating, this will result always in a posterior distribution over the input space. Okay, you will always have this probability, posterior probability distribution of your parameters. Whilst with history matching, that's not always the case. After we run the iterative process, it might be the case 
that the set of acceptable matches is empty. Okay, we might not find this subset, um, but that's not a bad thing because that might be telling us that we need to rework the model or that there might be something that needs to be um, modified in the sense that it might not be the, co the correct type of model that we are using. Or there might be some physics that we haven't taken into account, etc., etc. <clears throat> now, in order to carry out history matching, we need to distinguish between different types of uncertainty. The first one of which is observational uncertainty, which is just experimental error, which is subject to uh, instrument accuracy. We need to take into account model discrepancy, which always exists, um, and however uh, carefully we build our model, there will always be a difference between the real system and the simulator. Models are always wrong. Wrong, sorry. We need to take into account code uncertainty. Um, this means that for any choice of inputs, the output is known when the model is wrong. However, the simulator can be computationally expensive, and in that case, if we cannot afford to run the model in the whole input space, then we can make assumptions about the distribution of the of the output uh, when we use, for example, a, a Bayesian surrogate model, and that induces uncertainty that can be measured. And there's also something called ensemble variability when our simulator can be stochastic. In our case, uh, the simulator is deterministic. So this is a um, diagram of how history matching works. We start with an initial design. This means we start from a sample of the whole input space. Then we evaluate that sample using our model and we do that if this model is expensive we do that only in a reduced number of samples <clears throat> and then we emulate or use a surrogate model to get a, a better idea of what the output looks like in uh, input configurations that we haven't tried yet then we apply this implausibility test i've mentioned before and uh, we uh, obtain a non-implausible sample or a sample from this non-implausible space that we are trying to identify. Then we apply some stopping condition. If we are satisfied, we finish, but if not, we go back and evaluate our model again using our new samples and we start again. In the literature, we call these iterations waves. Okay, so let's see what are we doing in each one of these steps. <clears throat> the, as I said, we can use an emulator or a surrogate model. Uh, there are many out there. The one we use is a Gaussian process emulator. So this is built by describing the output of the model as a combination of two things. A term that is going to take care of the global shape or global form of the output and a stochastic process that is going to take care of the local variations. So this is a Bayesian uh, method. So we have subjective information about the uh, form of the output and we express that as a Gaussian process. So, so this is uh, our prior distribution for the output. And then we update this belief using data, using evaluations of our model which is objective information. So what we get is a posterior distribution of our output given our parameters and given our model evaluations. And this is also a Gaussian process with certain mean structure and certain covariance structure. So um, in, in this uh, very simple graph, I can show what we are doing. So this is, uh, suppose that this uh, points here are evaluations of an expensive computer model. Okay, Since it's expensive, we can only afford to have those <coughs> six points that you see there. And our emulator is going to use the mean of that resulting Gaussian process to approximate the true function. So <coughs> our approximation is going to look like this um, line here. If you can also see this, the dotted line that is behind, that's the true uh, function that we don't know. And the 
uh, posterior uh, variance or the posterior uh, standard deviation is going to give us these uncertainty bounds that are going to tell us um, or that, that are going to, to give us a measurement of the uncertainty we're incurring in because we're using an approximation. Okay, you can see that the uncertainty is zero whenever we have data. The uncertainty there is, um, I mean, the, the data there, the value of the data is known, so the uncertainty is zero. <clears throat> now, once we've emulated our computer model, then we use an implausibility measure. And this is just a distance between the output of our emulator and the target, the target value, which is an observation, right? Remember, we're, we're calibrating this model. So this is the distance between the output of our model and the observed uh, data. So the implausibility measure that we use is given by this uh, equation here. And it's, as I said, basically a distance between this z, which is an observation, and the surrogate. This is the, the mean of the Gaussian process. So this is the, the surrogate that we're using. Uh, but we standardize it, so that's why we divide it. And we divide it using all our sources of uncertainty, which are the observational uncertainty, code uncertainty, model discrepancy, and uh, ensemble variability, if, if there is uh, any. Okay, so we are taking into account all our sources of uncertainty. This is not just a simple distance. We are taking into account all these sources. And then at each iteration, at, at, at each wave of history matching, we can define a non-implausible set, which is the set of all uh, inputs for which this implausibility is less than three. And, and there is a, a reason why choosing three as a, as a threshold, there's a theorem that characterizes um, probability distributions that are symmetrical and 95% uh, of the probability mass is within uh, minus three and three. Now, there is a natural analogy that connects history matching and reliability analysis. So we could regard this non-implausible set as a failure domain. And what I mean by that is the following. Um, oh, before, I, before I go there, uh, we could, uh, in reliability analysis, one is interested in identifying the combination of inputs to a model that would lead to an output that, we con that could be considered failure in the sense that it would go beyond certain thresholds. Uh, there is, it's, it's a very similar type of uh, identification here to identify this non-impossible space and the failure domain, and this will become relevant because we're going to use one technique from reliability analysis to sample from this set. Okay, so uh, what are we doing? I, as I said, the model takes uh, inputs and, uh, and produces outputs. We are not using all of them. We are using a simpler version of the simulator. So <clears throat> how it's working is that we have a number of alveolar compartments. So in this case, we have alpha alveolar compartments. And for each one of those, we have three parameters, <clears throat> three input parameters, one stiffness, one extrinsic pressure, <clears throat> and one threshold opening pressure for the alveolar unit one, right? And then we do that, uh, we, we do the same, we model it, uh, the same until the uh, last alveolar unit, which also depends on three parameters. So we have three times the number of alveolar units. Those parameters um, constitute the input of our model. <clears throat> they go into the model and they produce certain output. The three outputs that we are going to uh, focus on are carbon dioxide, oxygen, and peak pressures. Okay. Uh, we run history matching. Um, we run the process that I've just described for this reduced model, which, I mean, it's, it's reduced in the, in the sense of the number of parameters, but it's still quite computationally expensive, so we need to use an emulator um, in order to, to do history matching on it. And the output of this history matching of this um, uh, procedure is this non-implausible space. So if you 
uh, disregard for the moment the, the lower part of this, of this uh, matrix of uh, images. What we're interested here in the upper part are the purple uh, subsets. You can see here, uh, this is a model run for five alveolar units, three parameters each, and these purple um, subsets here are the pairwise combination of input values that would match a certain target. And the interesting thing about these subsets is that they are much smaller than the whole input space, right? So these are pairwise uh, scatter plots, but you can see that these subsets here are much smaller. So they could be considered um, rare events, and we would like to simulate from these rare events. Now, you can imagine that in 15 dimensions in this case, trying to sample from those small subsets is quite challenging, and it becomes even more challenging as the dimensions grow, the number of dimensions grow. So in order to sample from those subsets that make up this non-implausible space that we're interested in identifying, and especially in, in the cases when, when we have this type of disconnected geometry, uh, what we use is a technique from reliability analysis called subset simulation. This uh, technique was developed by Awan Beck in 2001 to simulate rare events and estimate probabilities of failure. We are not estimating probabilities of failure here. The problem here is just to sample from that, uh, from those rare events. And the idea is to decompose uh, a rare event F into a sequence of progressively less rare events. So we are going to model this uh, rare event F as contained in this nested sequence of events where F1 is frequent, so it's easy to sample from, and then we're uh, based on that, we're going to sample from progressively more and more rare events until we only sample from the set of interest. In the case of history matching, the case of interest is the non implausible space, which is the combination of inputs that deliver the output that is as close as possible to the target observed value. Um, so this is an example of subset simulation. So um, we see here this function, and it's suppose that we want to sample from these gray subset, subsets here on, in, on the margins. Uh, they are disconnected, they are rare because the, the area of these gray subsets is much smaller than the whole input space, and subset simulation um, progresses iteratively, second, third, by the fourth iteration, it's um, it's uh, sampling from these subsets, um, and if we continue the, this process, it will eventually sample from the, the set of interest. How does this work? Well, we explore the whole input space by generating a relatively uh, small number of samples. Okay, so these are um, small number of samples. We evaluate those samples in our in our model, and we rank them. Okay, once we rank them we take a percentage, let's say 10% highest samples, highest uh, ranked samples, and then we forget about the rest and we somehow generate more samples based on the ones that we chose, the, the better ranked ones. Okay, so we generate an intermediate failure domain. Um, and the way we generate more samples based on this uh, on these samples here that we are going to call seeds is using Markov chain Monte Carlo. So we use Marco Markov chain Monte Carlo to generate more samples that are contained in that first intermediate failure domain. So these samples cannot uh, be placed here on the set that we have already discarded. So we produce more samples here and you can imagine what's going to happen from now. We're going to evaluate them in our model, we're going to rank them, we're going to take the highest ranked, um, define a second intermediate failure domain, 
then use Markovich and Monte Carlo to produce more samples, and we will proceed there until we populate this um, event or this set F here, which is what we're interested in doing. So this is just a schematic of, of how this works. We've taken again, the, in this case, the two better ranked samples, and then we produce more samples from there. Okay, so this is how we are uh, able to identify the combination of inputs in our uh, pulmonary simulator that deliver the output that is as close as possible from the target. Um, and not only that, it's not giving us one single answer, it's giving, giving us a set of, or a sample of uh, input combinations that do that, which is better than having only one, which is what the genetic algorithm is doing, and is doing it as at a fraction of the cost uh, due to the use of the, of the emulator. <clears throat> so, we have calibrated this uh, simulator using history matching, using subset simulation, and this has allowed us to generate a set of parameter configurations for which the simulator output matches a target, considering all the sources of uncertainty, right? This is not done blindly. We, we have considered all these sources. <clears throat> we have uh, reduced the computation for this calibration from more than 12 hours to less than one hour. Currently, we're still doing some um, improvements to this, which include, for example, parallelization. We expect to do this to, to be able to reduce this even further. Our vision is to provide clinicians with sets of parameter values, for example, ventilator settings, that can guide clinical decision making. But there are still many important challenges. For example, the number of alveoli right now is reduced. I'm, I'm sure some of you are already thinking, well, you're only using five alveolar units. We have many more than that in a realistic scenario. We need to handle model discrepancy. We need uh, to think of a way of quantifying this, how wrong is the model that we are using. And we should be able to calibrate this dynamically. Right now, we are only matching one target, but that target might change dynamically. We might be receiving, or we will be receiving uh, data from those monitors, and that changes. We need to, to do this every time, and we need to do that um, efficiently. Um, okay, uh, I'm almost finishing here. Uh, I'd like to invite you to collaborate with us. We plan for our data sets to be available to others and uh, we welcome chances to work together, including joint new uh, grant applications. And we want to build a, a vibrant early career research community. So please do approach us uh, with PhD fellowship, started grant ideas, um, etc. Uh, we also organize a monthly virtual seminar. Uh, follow us in uh, at UCL Chimera in uh, uh, on Twitter for for updates. Uh, thank you very much, and I will be very happy to answer your questions. Great, thank you uh, for that, Alex. We've got a question straight away uh, from. Uh, Sina, so I'll hand straight over. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sina Safran, and I used to work at Chimera Work Package 2 with Alex. Just for the sake of IP, I would like to add something. Uh, the very first simple version of the model was uh, developed by a clinician, Professor Jonathan Hartman. And then over the past 10, 20 years, the model has been developing and improving uh, in another group at the University of Warwick under the supervision of Professor Declan Bates. So at Chimera, we didn't develop the model, but we have been using the model. We are developing another model of the respiratory system at Chimera, which has not come quite together yet. Just adding that. Okay, great. Thank you. Um... Okay, so uh, Salman has a question. Go ahead, Salman. Well, thank, thank you, Alejandro, a really interesting talk. So I just wanted to just get an understanding of the potential 
clinical applications of this approach? Do you see the long term being dynamic optimization of ventilator settings, for example, to reduce lung injury in patients that are ventilated? Or you, you presented in your first slide a lot of temporal data that's acquired on the ICU in patients that are ventilated. Do you have any plans to see whether the, that temporal data can be used to predict sentinel events in patients on the ITU? For example, you know, uh, ventilation, you know, failure of adequate ventilation, development of sepsis, for example, and, you know, ventilator associated pneumonia through these physiological signals. It was just really getting an understanding of the translational end game of this approach. Yes, thanks. Um, um... Definitely, they. So what what we have here is uh, is this this model, right? That needs to be calibrated. But uh, as you very rightly say, we have all these uh, time series, and in order to do that, um, what we plan to do is use um, techniques with sequential Monte Carlo. So there is a new PhD student who has just joined, uh, who is an expert on on sequential Monte Carlo. And, uh, and the idea is to incorporate this type of techniques for, uh, for calibration. So, so you have this continuous stream of data you're receiving and you're updating your, uh, well, in this case, the distribution for your parameters, that probability distribution is going to be updated uh, sequentially and as new data is arriving, then, um, then it, is, it is updated. Uh, so yes, it's it's not exactly history matching what what is done there. It's uh, as I said, it's it's uh, sequential uh, Monte Carlo sampling, uh, but but yeah, we are we are considering or we are, we are working already in, in doing that because you know the the wealth of, of data we have is uh, demands. Thank you. Um, okay, I didn't get the order, I'm afraid, in which these hands went up, so I'm just going to go in the order there on my screen. So, uh, Declan? Hello. Um, thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, I just had a quick question about the, the use of the emulator. Um, so this is not a, an area that I'm an expert in at all, but it, it strikes me that there must be some kind of trade-off, right? that um, you're substituting the use of the original mo model with, with the use of the emulator because it's computationally a lot less expensive. Um, but then there's got to be a price to pay for that because the emulator will be a, a less accurate model than the computationally expensive model. So is there any way in general to try to understand how to manage that trade-off? Um, yes, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, so yes, indeed, there's always when you use an approximation, there will be something that is lost. And, uh, and one could argue, well, you could use something else. You could use a neural network or you could use um, any other uh, surrogate out there. Uh, we like to use uh, Gaussian processes because they come with a measure of uncertainty. They come with a, a posterior variance that that measures that error. Um, now, when you do an approximation using these kind of techniques, you can also validate and uh, you, you can apply a measures of fit, right? So for example, you can, uh, you can study the residuals uh, coming from a, making a prediction and then comparing that prediction to, uh, to real data, right? Or removing one of the one of the one of the data points that you use to to train the emulator, and then making a prediction and then comparing that with the, with the true true value, right? So you can study those uh, those residuals. Those residuals should behave in certain way. They they should resemble a t distribution. So you you see whether those residuals are lie within minus three and three. You see whether that um, a, whether those residuals have a, a random behavior because you, you don't want something that, that resembles uh, you know, anything periodic or anything linear. You want that to, those residuals to be uh, random. And then you can say something about uh, whether you are confident that that 
approximation is, is working or is suitable. Uh, it might be the case that it's not, and then you need to change the assumptions on, 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 on this emulator, right? You can change, for example, the covariance structure and you can, um, and you can adapt for different types of behavior of, of, of data. But yeah, the, there are uh, different ways in which you can uh, verify the fit of the, of, the mod, of the emulator to the model. Okay, thank you. Jeffrey Maxim. Hello, oh, I don't know. Can you see me? Yep, we've got you and we can hear you. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, thanks for that talk. I was struck by, it is a very complex model and uh, granted the respiratory system is very complex and submitting it to mechanical ventilation makes it even more complicated. Um, and it's not a unique approach to try to use uh, a complex model for predicting and helping clinicians make decisions around ventilatory modes or ventilatory settings in, in a critical care. In fact, I remember my colleague in the 90s developed a, not a multi-scale model, but a very complex feedback-based model with multiple compartments, so multiple compartments instead of multi-scale. Uh, to try to address that problem on proportional assist. But I'm, I'm struck by the, the field's approach to trying to model everything and, and multiple uh, elements of everything. For example, the, the question or the difficulty, the challenge with including uh, multiple alveoli, getting to that small scale, makes the computational requirements very demanding. Is it necessary? So the, the, the question comes from um, a good model that we learn something about the physiology is as simple as possible, but no simpler, right? It includes the necessary behavior we uh, are lacking understanding, and then we understand it once, once we include it. Um, in, in the case of real-time prediction, and like Salman uh, Siddiqui's uh, question about, can we use imaging data to help this out? Because the number of alveoli, how many do you need? Well, you need, you need if, if each alveoli behaved independently and differently, you'd need them all, but we, we don't. Most of the alveoli behave quite similarly, except for the heterogeneity that arrives in disease, and maybe because of gravity, well, because of gravity and some other things. These things means you can reduce the complexity of your alveolar uh, modeling to fewer just to capture the heterogeneity. So I wonder if time might be well spent reducing the complexity and uh, trying to address that question of, of making the model simpler, but not simpler than you than it needs to be. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great point. That also gives me a lot of hope because, <laughs> because uh, reducing the, the computational cost of, of, this, uh, of this model is not, well, it's, it's challenging in the sense that, um, I mean, so far, each one of the alveolar units is uh, exact, contributes exactly the same in, in, in the same proportion, let's say, to the output, right? You, can, you cannot apply just a common dimensionality reduction technique and eliminate some of them and, and pretend they are not important. So, so we've been thinking a lot about how do we uh, reduce this, um, this uh, computational burden and, and, and the approach we are trying now is, is, is uh, a parallelization. Uh, but what you say gives me hope because, uh, because yes, we, we think that there, there should be a way to better cluster those types of, uh, of alveoli. And, uh, and work with, uh, with less classes of them rather than just trying to do it uh, massively. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is not the only uh, model we are working with. I, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert spe specifically on the model. The, the, the expert is Sina, which just spoke, and, and Declan as well. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I mean, we, I, I think that, that, that the next step would be to try and uh, and characterize different clusters of alveoli that we can model separately, and that would uh, definitely uh, reduce the the computational cost of, of the model and also of the uh, of the emulation. So, yeah, thanks for glad, glad to hear it. <laughs> Thank you. Great. 
uh, and uh, Draga. Uh, hello. Hopefully you can hear me and see me because I was switched off so far. Um, so thank you very much for your talk. I have several questions. Uh, so the first one is actually related to the previous question. And so my question really is, you know, um, have you tried comparing your approach uh, using several different models, basically? Because I think the outcome of your approach is going to be only as good as the mechanical model that underlines the whole system. And so have you had a chance to kind of compare several models to each other and then to what clinicians say they see in real data, the outcomes from real data. So that's my first question. And my second question is, uh, if I may, sorry for, for being um, sort of, of taking over space. Uh, how, I didn't understand how you deal with correlations because I can imagine that both, um, you know, the optimization that you're doing in terms of the output as well as the input, there's a lot of correlation going on in the system. And so how, how do you deal with that? Do you, do you have any advice on that? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, so as I said, it's, um, so we have three parameters per alveolar unit and we have three outputs. So you would say, okay, those three outputs in this case might not necessarily, or there's no reason that why they should be independent, right? Uh, right now, the modeling is done as, as if they were independent. Uh, so so we, are, we are essentially feeding three emulators, right? Per one per, um, per output. Um, how to deal with uh, correlations? Well, one would have to use a, a multi-output emulator and that requires uh, estimation of, uh, of these correlations. Um, and it's, and it's uh, work uh, that is currently in progress. Uh, something else that is in progress is a, another version of, not exactly this model, but there's, there's another model that is being worked uh, on in, in Chimera. My, my colleagues are working on this. This is uh, a model, as far as I understand, it's, uh, it's based on, it's an ODE-based model uh, that includes also a, cardiac effects and includes uh, gravity and, uh, and position of the patient. So, so far we haven't compared with, with any other model, but I do know that my colleagues are working on different models and the idea in the end eventually would be that, to do that comparison. Thank you. Thank you.